So we'll talk about recombinant protein expression today. What does that mean? What do you guys know about that so far? Recombinant protein expression would be put in DNA from different proteins in an organism that has a specific gene. And then you talk to that protein. Yes, exactly. Okay, so you know what it is. Um, it's a cheap way to make proteins, depending on what system you use. So there's different systems. We'll talk about a couple, then the bacterial system, which is the cheapest. Uh, it's fast. So I guess first let's just, we'll talk, first we'll talk about the bacterial way to do it and the pluses and minuses of bacterial recombinant protein expression. So some of the pluses is cheap, it's fast. Bacteria, what's the doubling time of E. coli? 30 minutes. So that's why it's so fast. Um, but the minuses, if you need a pro, so proteins aren't just amino acids. Sometimes proteins get post-translationally modified or glycosylated. So if you need post-translational, translational modifications, then the bacterial is a bad way to do that because bacteria don't have a lot of the post-translational modifications like glycosylation glycosylation that eukaryotes do. Bacteria have some types of glycosylation, but it's kind of, it's just in general, bacteria don't have the robustness of post-translational modifications that eukaryotes do. So if you need a particular protein for a use in a human and it needs to have some kind of modification, the bacterial system is probably not the way to do that. Um, so that's one of the minuses. One of the other minuses is the, is folding. So like a lot of proteins, right, have a three-dimensional structure. And in order to get to that three-dimensional structure, as they're popping off of the ribosome, they find chaperones. What are chaperones? Proteins that basically help them fold. So they're proteins that will do the folding for them to assemble like the final 3D structure. So you can imagine if you have are trying to express a eukaryotic protein, in a bacteria that doesn't have the right chaperones, uh, it might not fold properly. So, and another thing too is like in eukaryotes, a lot of these proteins are made for very, very specific organelles. Um, and if you don't have those certain organelles, it might not, it might not end up in this, in the correct, I guess what you would call the tertiary or quaternary structure. Um, so those are all considerations, but in general, usually if you just, your, your first try, um, a lot of people will do bacteria first because it's usually just the easiest way. And most of the times it works. So we've talked about bacterial strains before, and there's many different types of strains. And each of these strains have a special genotype for a particular function, right? And within bacteria, there's many different specialized strains that are made for recombinant protein expression. So whatever you make your plasmid in, let's say you build your plasmid in E. coli. Let's say you build it in a strain called top 10 F prime. You don't usually then express the protein in that same strain. Usually you have to transfer it to a specialized strain that's made for recombinant protein expression. So we'll talk about some of these strains and we'll talk about some of the differences in the genomes that, that make them designed specifically for recombinant protein expression. So we talked about before how top 10 F prime is a rec A, it's a rec A minus strain. So that means it doesn't have the rec A gene. And the reason we don't want it to have the rec A gene is because rec A uh, stimulates recombination. And if we build a plasmid in there, we don't want it to recombine that plasmid somewhere on the chromosome and, and break our plasmid. So that's one example of that I've talked about before of how these bacterial strains can be have subtle differences. So one of these strains that you'll use a lot is called BL21. Okay. So if we just look at the BL21 genotype, oh, can't draw on this. Um, one of the, the main things with the BL21 genotype is that if you look right here, it's deficient in LAN and OMPT proteases. What do you think that that means? 
Right. So bacteria have proteases that will cleave and cut proteins like LON. LON is the name of one, or AMPT is the name of one. So in BL21, they've deleted LON and they've deleted AMPT. And the reason is because if you say express your protein in top 10 F prime, which has LON and it has AMPT, a lot of times you will express that protein and you'll run an STS page shell and you'll look at your protein and your protein will look like this. What do you think that that data means? If this is, let's say your protein is 50 kilodaltons and this is 50 kilodaltons and you do a Western blot for your protein and you see this, what do you think that that means? Yeah, it's been degraded. It's been subject to degradative proteases. They're not completely degrading it, right? Like they're cutting it, they're cutting it if it's a, if you think of proteins as linear or something, it's cutting it here, and that's producing a size fragment here and here, which maybe corresponds to this and this. And then one of these is getting cutting up, which is corresponding to this and this. So you'll see this, it's very, very common in bacteria when you try to express recombinant protein. The bacteria often doesn't times like making a bunch of that protein, so it will start to try to like cut it up. And you'll get what are called degradative products. Degradative products, it's a system of degradation. It's very, very common, okay? And sometimes it's not a problem because sometimes you can just purify the protein and you can just purify it through say like size exclusion chromatography, and you could purify out this top band so you could get rid of the degradative product. So sometimes it's not a problem. But if your majority of your protein is a degradative product, like you might care about that, that you might not want that thing that cut up because it's not your wild type protein. So oftentimes it's helpful to express recombinant proteins and strains like BL21 that have deleted the main bacterial proteases. And if you actually do plus minus experiments, so if you do plus LON minus LON protease, you can actually see like the protein shift up and not be degraded anymore. So we use specialized strains that are often deficient in proteases or deleted for specific proteases in the bacteria. And that's because we don't want our protein that we're expressing to get cut up. Uh, okay, so let's talk about BL21AI. So you'll see stuff like this where you'll see this. Now we know what this means. This means it's deleted for proteases. And if you really want to know, you can just look these up, right? You can, and it tells you exactly, tells you exactly what it is. And there's some other stuff too, but the protease is the main thing. And now there's another strain that has added this thing, AI. So what's AI? So if we look at the genotype, AI... Look at right here, era B, T7 RNA P tet A. So this means that there was a, if we read it, um, carrying the T7 RNA polymerase gene in the era B locus of era bad operon. What do we remember about the era bad operon? Right, it's an arabinose metabolism. Operon. Okay, so let me ask you a question. If you take PBAD, the plasmid, which runs on the era promoter, which in the presence of arabinose will turn on. Okay, let's say you put that in top 10 F prime. Now you add arabinose to induce expression of your protein. What's going to happen to the arabinose in the cell? It's going to get eaten. It's a sugar. So it will, the bacteria, the top 10, will actually eat it up. So you can't actually use, PBAT is not compatible with like wild type bacteria. You can't just pop in a PBAD plasma and express a protein because all that's going to happen is it'll express it transiently. And then as soon as all the arabinose gets eaten, it will shut off, right? So in order to use PBAD, you have to use it in specialized strains where they've deleted parts of the arabinose metabolism operon. So when you look at the strain, what it's telling you is era B. There's an insertion of a transposon. 
So what that what that what those words are telling you, if this is the era operon, I don't remember the exact genes, but let's just say A, B, C, D. What this is telling you is in era B, there's an insertion of a transposon that inserts the T7 RNA polymerase. So there's an insertion of a gene in B which breaks B. Okay, so that's one part of it is the era operon is broken. And the, the reason it's broken is so that we want the arabinose to not be degraded. We want it to sit around in the cell so that it can continually keep those PBAD promoters on. So that's one part of the AI. The other thing is this T7 RNA polymerase. So they've actually inserted a gene. So if you were to look at B and you were to zoom in on it, B is broken here because there's been something inserted. And what they've inserted is a new gene called T7 RNA polymerase, okay? So T7 is a virus. So what do you think that this means? What would a T7 RNA polymerase gene be? What do RNA polymerases do? Right, what's that called in the central dogma? Transcription, so they transcribe. But this is a special, we, this was on the first test. There's certain parts of RNA polymerase complexes that can make them very specific for very certain promoters, right? Like remember the sigma factor, which can make it very, very specific. So the thing about the T7 RNA polymerase is that it's a very specific RNA polymerase that will only turn on T7 phage genes because there's a little signal sequence. Now, what you don't know what I haven't taught you yet is that there are plasmids called PET plasmids that are built in with the T7 promoter and then a lac operon upstream of your gene X so then to turn these plasmids on, you have to add IPTG, which turns on the lac operon. But even if you do that, if you, this is in top 10, it won't express your protein. You have to express it in a strain that has the T7 RNA polymerase, which will bind to that T7 promoter and turn on in the presence of IPTG. Does that make sense? So what this BL21 AI strain is telling you is that this is a specialized strain that will work with PBAD promoters and PET plasmids because it's got the T7 RNA polymerase and it's also, it's inserted into the air B locus to break it. Okay. What do you think TET A means? What's TET stand for? an antibiotic, tetracycline. So they selected for this insertion into the B operon by selecting with tetracycline. So if you pull out BL21 AI and you plate it on plus tetracycline LB plates, should it grow? Yes. That's one reason you can select for it. It should. Um, what's next? Rosetta. Okay, so that's BL21 and BL21 AI. There's also Rosetta cells. Rosetta cells. Okay, Rosetta cells are derived from BL21. So that means they're deficient in lon um, T proteases. Okay, but they have a special plasmid called P-Rare, and P-Rare encodes tRNAs that, uh, that make up the rare codons. So the premise of the Rosetta cells is that if you have something that's not codon optimized for E. coli, you can pop it into Rosetta cells, which have a plasmid, and on that plasmid, it encodes all the rare tRNAs. So in theory, you shouldn't have any issues with codon optimization if you're using Rosetta cells because they have this P-rare plasmid. 
Let's actually see if we can find the Rosetta genotype. Rosetta. So here they're telling you P, the plasma they have is P lice S rare contains tRNA genes RG. So this is an arginine codon, an arginine codon, uh, isoleucine codon, glycine codon, leucine codon, proline codon, methionine codon. So these are all the rare codons. It's encoding those. The rare codons here, blah 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 blah, blah are supplemented. So it tells you, and it also says DE3. If you see DE3, DE3 equals insertion of the T7 phage machinery. So this one is also compatible with PET plasmids because it's got the T7 RNA polymerase. Let's check that. T7 RNA polymerase from a lack promoter. Yeah, so here what's happening is you add IPTG, it turns on your T7 polymerase which then can turn on your pet plasmids. It's chloramphenicol resistant. So the Rosetta, the P-Rare plasmid, has a chloramphenicol resistance cassette. So you can select for that. So here's a funny thing that one of my friends has done, is if you have a different strain that you want to use, let's say you don't want to use Rosetta, you could pull out the P-Rare plasmid from Rosetta. All you got to do is mini prep from the Rosetta, the mini prep will produce plasmid. Right, we did this in lab. And then you just transform that p rare plasmid into a strain X, strain X, and select on what? Chloramphenicol. So then you select with chloramphenicol and you could insert the p rare plasmid in any strain X. Okay, let's also talk about, um, let's see if there's anything else we're talking about. Let's talk about the P lice S. Yeah. yeah. So look at P lice S. It's another plasmid. So this strain has multiple plasmids. It's got a plasmid with P rare. It's got a plasmid with lice S. Oh, it's a, this is one plasmid that has a combination of these things, I think. And the P lice S plasmid encodes T7 phage lysozyme. What's lysozyme? Yeah, how do you, I'm I'm, I know why you know this, but, uh, but, but explain to them why you know this. Uh, well, actually, uh, this is one of the, oh, no, I do know where I know this from. Um, it's from a biotech lab. Oh, really? Oh, okay. I thought because you're a chicken person. So well, we, it's derived from eggs. Yes, it's derived from, so we, when you use lysozyme in the lab, we purify it from chicken eggs. Oh, you actually um, purify it in house? I don't, but oh. the companies who do it, they purify it from chicken eggs. And lysozyme is a enzyme that will basically degrade bacterial cell walls. So it, um, it's a, a lot of times it's used in the chicken egg, it's used as like a immunity protection against bacterial invasions, right? And we purify this and because what's the first step? So after we express the protein in the cells of bacteria, what do we have to do to get the protein out? We have to lysis cells. So oftentimes people will just add lysozyme Lysozyme, which will help degrade and break apart the bacterial cells to induce cell lysis. But you can get cells that already have a plasmid that encodes the lysozyme protein that then it makes these cells a lot easier to break open, okay, because it degrades their cell wall. So you can, you can imagine a lot of these bacteria, but E. coli is gram negative, but it still has a small cell wall. It's got a thin cell wall. And that's still a cell wall. Sometimes it's hard to break apart bacterial cells. So sometimes we add these chemicals like lysozyme that help break open the cell wall. And sometimes we even put the genes encoding those onto a plasmid, which helps the cell become easier to break open, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's DE3 if you see it. Uh, okay, so let's talk about, there's other ways to express proteins, not just bacteria, right? There's yeast. So if you, say, need a particular uh, protein modification or a post-translational modification, but you still want to do it on the cheap, yeast is a, best, is a real good bet. So there's two different strains people will use. People will use S. cerevisiae 
Vissier, whatever. I always spell it wrong. Um, we already talked about that. That's common baker's yeast. But there's also another strain of yeast of fungi called Picia pastoris. I've never used it before, but I know people who have used it. And it's like the classical example of you need a post-translational modification um, and you want to still do it cheaply, so you do it in Picia. That's kind of like the, it's a little bit better than Saccharomyces for recombinant protein expression. So people use it if you need glycosylation, if you need some special glycosylation event. Um, and there's plasmids. Uh, we already know that there's plasmids you can make with Saccharomyces. So same thing, there's plasmids you can make that are, that work well in Picia pastoris. So just so that you've heard of those, if somebody says, oh, I expressed this in Picia pastoris, that, that's why, because they wanted some recombinant, or they wanted some post-translational modification. Okay. And then we start to get closer and closer and closer. Um, a lot of things, if you need them very folded very, very specifically, you need a very, very specific post-translational modification. The next step up in kind of getting closer and closer to the human systems are insect cell cultures. Okay, so people will use SF9 cells or S2 cells. SF9 are fall armyworm. So I put down the species, it's Spodoptera. This is an agricultural pest, Spodoptera. And people use these SF9 cells for recombinant protein expression. And S2 cells are Drosophila. So what you should know is you should know, you should, if you see SF9 cells, you'll see these in papers, SF9 cells, know that that's like a, it's a lepidopteran. It's a, it's basically like a moth, uh, fall armyworm, Spodoptera. If you see S2 cells, that's Drosophila. So those are Drosophila fruit fly cell cultures. Um, just so that you know what those are. These are a lot more expensive because a lot of times the media, May, how much is the media? It's fucking expensive. <laughs> uh, we just bought some. That's why she knows. Uh, it's really expensive. Um, it's I guess it's cheap in terms of, I guess, I mean, it's still like cheaper than other things, but it's really expensive. And a lot of times you have to supplement the media with what's called FBS, fetal bovine serum, which is like they take a fetal calf and then they kill it. They take the blood and then they purify it. And then that's what you have sometimes have to supplement into this. And FBS can be very expensive, too. Um, so this media can be very, very expensive. Uh, let's see. And how do you how do you express with it? Here, these use baculovirus. So you're not actually making like a plasmid um, that you insert into these cell cultures. You actually synthesize uh, insertions into a virus, and then you infect the cells with virus particles, and then the particles integrate and express the trans the recombinant protein. So it's a different, it's a completely different system. It's not plasma. It's based on baculovirus. I won't, you won't need to know in this class, like how to do baculovirus stuff, but know that it exists and know that if you ever got into the position where you're like, you're doing research on human stuff or something, and you want to make like a human protein, a lot of times they will express those proteins from baculovirus in Drosophila cells. So then you would spend your whole master's or PhD project figuring out how to how to do that. So just know that that and that's very common that people do that. Let's see. So there then when you can talk about inducible expression, we already know what that means. That means if you add something X, it turns on the promoter. So the most common ones in bacteria are IPTG, which turns on what operon? Lac operon. Uh, and why do we use IPTG? Why not lactose? Yeah, IPTG does not get degraded. It's the same principle as why you need the era B deletion for the arabinose operon. So if you add arabinose, that's the other popular one, that's going to turn on the era operon. Okay. But these have to be incompatible um, cells that have the machinery for that deleted to make it work. You always need to make sure that your plasmid is compatible with what you're working with in terms of this strain. Um, oh, okay. So here's a question. You set up a culture of bacteria. When? When do you add the IPTG or the arabinose? What are you 
uh, recombinant express protein X. So you have a plasmid. Let's say you got the lac operon, the lac operator, and you got gene X, and you put this in bacterial cells. You inoculate a culture in the morning. How do you know when to add the IPTG? Do you just add it right away? What do you think? Yeah, you got to let them grow a little bit. So when you look at bacterial growth cycles, it looks like this. Okay, so if this is if this is like number of bacteria on the y-axis and on the x-axis, this is time. Okay, doubling time every 30 minutes. That means that's in what's called log phase or exponential growth phase, which corresponds to this right here. So when I say doubling time every 30 minutes, bacteria aren't gonna double every 30 minutes for infinity, why? Right, there's not enough resources. So there's when you put them in a soup, in a broth, you're giving them a finite amount of resources that they can eat, and for a period of time, they will double, so this time from here to here would be 30 minutes. They would double every 30 minutes, okay? Now, what's going to happen if you add the IPTG right at this point? After, let's say, eight hours. Yeah, it takes, it takes energy and resources to make proteins. So if you add the IPTG or the arabinose, when the bacteria have already consumed all the resources, they're not going to turn on your protein because they just don't have any resources to make protein anymore. They've already replicated to the point where they're fixated. Okay, so usually we add IPTG or arabinose at what's called 0.5 OD, and that's usually right, right in the middle of the curve, okay, so that they still have a lot of time to continue growing, but during this growth, they're expressing your protein. So OD is what's called optical density, okay, and it's a quantitative measure of particles in solution. So it's literally just a measure of cloudiness. If you get more and more and more bacteria in a solution of LB soup, it gets more and more and more cloudy because there's finite little particles. So well, the way that you measure this is you, how do you think you measure this? Yeah, you take a spectrophotometer and this is common for yeast too, right? You open up a little panel and inside that panel is a little laser that shoots a laser and you put in a little, oh, kind of draw on top, you put in a little cuvette and in your cuvette, you put in a blank. What's a blank? Yeah, in this case it'd be media, so it'd be LB, but it's without bacteria, without bacteria. So you're measuring what's the cloudiness without any bacteria. It's called the blank. You always blank, and then you measure a cuvette with usually a dilution. So usually you'll do, uh, well, actually, if you're growing it, you'll just do straight up. So you usually just put in a mill of your LB from your culture, and then you press the button, it'll shoot a laser, and then it will give you a readout of the OD at 600 nanometers. What's that mean? Yeah, you can adjust the wavelength of the spectrophotometers to see different things. So when we measure OD for bacteria and yeast, we measure it at 600 nanometers. So the perceptive machine is 600 nanometers. You press a button, it shoots a laser, and it'll tell you 0 0.01. That means you're not ready to add. Okay, then you come back 30 minutes later, you test it again. What do you think it's going to read? You come back 30 minutes later, and you test it again. What's this going to read? It's going to be 0 0.4 and then it will be 0 0.8, and then it will be 1.6, and then it will be, oh God, math on the spot. And then eventually, maybe 15 more minutes, you get a hit about 0 0.5. That's when you add your IPTG or your Arabinos. 
Okay. And you can actually, so, so what you'll do is you'll come in the morning, you'll set up your culture from an overnight culture. It'll be, uh, in the shaker shaking around. Okay. And then maybe you'll come back 1.5 hours later and you'll just take a quick OD reading to see where it's at. Let's say it's at here. It's at 0 0.4 or 0 0.04. Okay. Then you can just literally write down on a piece of paper. Okay. And now it's going to be 30 plus another 30 plus another 30 plus give or take 15 minutes. So that's going to be an hour and 45 minutes from now. You come back an hour and 45 minutes from now. You take a quick OD. It'll hit right 0 0.5. Then you add your stuff. Does that make sense? So it's very predictive. Uh, bacteria always grow, usually double every 30 minutes. And so this is, this is how we know when to add the reagents. And we want to hit it when it's at what's called mid-log phase. Um, okay, this is taking a little bit slower. Okay, so I talked about that. Uh, let's talk about common vectors. We've already know quite a bit of these. We already know the PBAD, that's the Rabinos operon pet vectors. Pet vectors are, again, like I said, I'll just reiterate this. There are plasmids, and the plasmids have the T7 uh, promoter. So that means you don't get good expression unless you have a T7 RNA polymerase. And these are usually combined with a LAC operon. So you have to add both IPTG and then... IPTG will turn on the operon, but you also need the T7R T7 RNA polymerase to get good transcription of your gene X. That's a pet vector. PGX. So I've used all three of these. Um, they're all they're all good. They're all very common. So PGX vectors have a GST tag. This is a purification system, so it's like an affinity tag, glutathione S transferase, which binds glutathione beads. And I say this because we've already talked about affinity tags, but I wanted to talk about a little bit. Usually these plasmids, so they'll co encode the start code on here, they'll encode GST here, and then your multi-cloning site will be here where you, include, where you clone gene X as a fusion onto GST. So usually you'll put your ATG here, your stop code on here. But I say this because I want to also point out that a lot of these plasmids usually have a little sequence right here. That's what's called a cleavage peptide. What do you think that is? If you want to express protein X, do you really want it as a fusion to another protein called GST? No. You often want to encode a way to get rid of GST. So you encode what's called a cleavage peptide, which can be recognized by usually what's a viral protease. So one of these is, one common one is enterokinase. You'll see enterokinase or EK cleavage site, or there's another one called precision protease. Okay, these are all like patented by the biotech companies. They're little cleavage sites, okay? And you'll purify your protein on the beads. So it'll be bound to a glutathione bead. And it'll be bound as a fusion to your gene X. And then instead of eluding, instead of eluding with glutathione, all you would do, so elution means coming off the column, right? That makes sense, right? Like I'm talking about we have beads on a column. You know what that means, and then it drips off. Instead of eluding this fusion, what you can do is in the top of the column, you add your precision protease or your enterokinase, which will recognize the cleavage site, cut it, and release your protein X off the column. And now it's really just usually wild type. Sometimes there's like, like a little cleavage peptide, maybe like a G or something like that. But for the most part, it's usually just like straight up wild type protein X. So that's a very common way of how you include a uh, affinity tag, but you also encode a way to cut it off so that you can just get your protein X. So that's common in the PGX system. Um, okay. 
Let's see. We'll talk about just media quick for a second. There's different types of media with all different types of purposes. Okay. So I'm just telling you all the variables you can vary. So LB, that's the most common one. What, what does that stand for? Yeah, Luria Bertini, or some people call it lysogeny broth. And the people who say Luria Bertani will tell you lysogeny broth is wrong. You shouldn't be saying that. But it's like people use both things. Uh, it's just a very, very basic um, bacterial soup mixture. Then there's TB, which is called terrific broth. Terrific broth is just like LB plus a bunch of other stuff. So basically, the only reason I tell you that there's two things that exist here is because you get the idea, right? Like sometimes if if you're expressing a protein in LB and you're not quite getting enough of it, you might consider changing the media. And if you change the media, maybe you can push your, so let's say, let's say this is a curve. Let's say red is a curve in LB and let's say black is a curve in terrific broth. You might be able to push the, um, the max, what would you call this? the max bacterial density that you can grow to in that broth by giving them like a more nutrient rich, rich environment, if that makes sense. So there's a way that you can kind of push to try to enhance your expression by switching medias. Um, shakers. So I'll show you this in the lab today. Today I'm just going to kind of like walk you through and show you the whole, just, we, we won't have enough time to like express a protein because it's like a it's like a week-long process but i'm going to walk you through the process and i'll show you all the things i'll show you all the things you need to consider so in the incubator uh which have shakers which basically shake left and right because you want to add air to the culture so that aerate your bacteria so you shake these things and you can set them to either 37 or you can set them to refrigerate at 18. so oftentimes to get the most maximal expression what people will do is they will grow the bacteria quick at 37 until it hits their um, 0.5 OD. Then they will add their IPTG or their Arabinose, and then they will decrease the temperature to let it express overnight at 18. And it kind of like slows it down and allows it to produce more protein. So the, to get maximal culture, maximal protein loads, oftentimes people will almost refrigerate the culture and grow it slowly overnight. But you can also just leave it at 37. And most people will basically, the fastest way to do it is to just add your IPTG and let it grow for four or more hours at 37. Then you can purify all in one day. Let's see. So lysis. So after you turn on the protein in the cell, you need to lyse the cells to get it out. So there's different methods of lysis because bacteria are, are basically very, very tiny and they're very, very hard. So it's, you have to crack them open. So when you do lysis, lysozyme is very common. You'll see lysozyme that's from the chicken egg white lysozyme. Like I said, that's an enzyme that degrades bacterial cell wall. People will also use a French press, which I'll show you today. These are going out of style, but I really like them. Um, it's basically an old machine that looks like a coffee press. And it's a huge thing that looks like this. I'll show you. Oh, you were like, what is that? Yeah, it's a, it's a big machine that literally just crushes the bacteria with high pressure. Um, yeah, that's the French press. We'll try to get it running today. And then um, there's other things. There's things called like microfluidizers. Um, a lot of these things basically lyse bacteria with high pressure. Um, so there's there's many different ways. These are the these are the ones that I like that I'll show you. But there's other ways. There's also sonication. Sonication is when you have a little probe that emits ultrasonic um, pulses. And you can make pulses that are strong enough to break open bacteria. So sonication is another very, very common way to lyse bacteria. Um, okay. We're good on time. So the other issue that's very, very common that you need to think about is the solubility of your protein X. Okay. So... What people will usually do is the first time they clone a gene into an expression vector, 
they don't know if that gene is going to be soluble or insoluble. Insoluble means it basically just falls out of solution and precipitates. So oftentimes, like membrane proteins, so proteins that have to sit inside the membrane, they transverse the, me they transverse the membrane, those are oftentimes insoluble. Why? Because their protein amino acids are made to sit in lipids, and lipids are not themselves soluble in water, right? So you can make oftentimes get insoluble proteins if you're trying to express membrane proteins. Um, soluble proteins are proteins that will sit in the cytoplasm. They literally just dissolve into water, and they float around in the cytoplasm. Most proteins are soluble, but oftentimes it's a, it's a huge issue that will forever be an issue if you work with a common expression of proteins is, is your protein soluble or not? Because um, it can create lots of problems. So when, the way that you test this is you'll just grow your bacteria, induce at 0 0.5 OD, and then you'll lyse the cells. And then when you lyse the cells, you get what's called the pellet and the soup, supernatant. You know what those are? So if you're growing a culture of bacteria, okay, you grow, you know you have particles, the bacteria growing in there. You lyse all the cells, so you split everything open, okay? And then you'll usually do a centrifugation, okay? And when you centrifuge, that's going to press all your insoluble stuff into a pellet. And then your media is going to be your soup. Okay, or your buffer, whatever you lysed it in. Okay, and so most of the time your recombinant proteins will be in your supernatant, and you can just take the supernatant and run it over your column. But if, let me show you a, a basically troubleshooting protocol. If you run your supernatant over your purification step, or you run this straight up on SDS page, so you run soup, and there's nothing there, and you're like, where the hell's my protein? What's your first guess? It's insoluble. Your first guess is if you see nothing in your supernatant, your first guess is your protein insol is insoluble. So then you take a little toothpick and you take a little chunk of your insoluble pellet and you run that on an STS page and oftentimes you'll see, oh, there it is. The reason you can take it and run it on an STS page is STS makes everything soluble, right? Because it string it lengthens out the protein coats it at negative charge so you can run insoluble stuff on an SCS page and you'll see it and if that's your thing then you're like shit it's insoluble and then you need to figure out ways to to deal with that but that's a very very common first step is SDS page and people will run the lanes look like this right well they'll run a marker which is the size ladder then they'll run their pellet then their soup and then their purification, and then they have various washes, wash one, wash two, where they're washing the beads, and then they'll run their elution. And usually what you'll see is, you'll always see, let's say your protein is right here, you'll always see a little bit in your pellet. Oh wait, let me move these, oh, I wish I could move these over. Usually they'll also do like a plus and a minus sample, which is plus IPTG minus IPTG. And usually then you would expect to see plus and nothing in your minus. And then you run your soup. Your soup might have a lot more, but you might, you're going to have a lot of other stuff, contaminants, and if you just run straight up supernatant. So then they'll do their purification, and you'll see the purification gets a little bit cleaner, but there might be some other stuff. And then after they've washed it, it gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, and your elutions should be really, really pure. So this is what you'll often see in papers. Uh, you'll see gels that look like this, where they're showing you kind of the whole purification process. So how do they do the purification process? Um, you can do it high tech and low tech. Low tech is gonna be like chromatography. So that's gonna be like you have a column, you put in beads, you're either doing size exclusion or ionic exclusion. This is basic chemistry. Your proteins run through and you're going to get different, you're going to get a column collector. So you'll collect as, as you just run this stuff through and you collect basically tubes 
and you call this fraction one, fraction two, fraction three. And as you collect, if you run your whole thing through, your protein will condense, usually most strongest in one fraction, okay? And everything else will kind of come out in different fractions based on the size or based on the ionic charge. That's, that's low-tech chromatography purification. And then you could, in theory, take this, and then that's, that's really where your recombinant protein is, if that's where it is. And you could detect that by SDS page. So you'll see people run gels, SDS page gels, and they'll show you fraction one, fraction two, fraction three, up to like fraction 25. And then you'll see where the protein is most like eluding. It'll look like that. And then they'll say, okay, it's best here. We'll take fractions four to seven. We'll combine them, and then that will we'll store as our purified protein. And you'll see other contaminants come out in other fractions. So it's a way to purify your protein, chromatography. Okay, and then there's FPLC, which is fast protein liquid chromatography. This is basically like mechanized, high speed, obviously fast protein liquid chromatography. So this is where you have a, an actual FPLC machine. And in that FPLC machine are columns. And there's a bunch of tubes. There's a bunch of tubular structures where you load in, it sucks up your protein, and it runs it through columns internally in the system at high pressure. So low volume, but high pressure. And then it will basically... Uh, purify your protein for you and then on the back end there will be what's called a fraction collector which will have a little thing that spits out and there's a little robotic there's a little robotic arm that holds tubes okay and then this thing will shift as it drips and fills in the tubes and then this thing will collect the fractions for you so this thing will collect like 1 to 96 fractions and then you run your SDS page, you figure out which fraction it's your protein is most in. Um, and then you'll actually get, uh, the interesting thing about this is as it's going through the system in the machine, there's a laser, or actually as it's coming off the column, there's a laser that shoots and measures absorbance of the protein at certain wavelengths. And you'll be able to see basically peak patterns of when proteins are emerging. And often what you'll see is something like this where this might be, this is your aggregate. This is like all the crap that's coming off right away. That's not your actual protein. And I should make this a little bit bigger. I should make it look like this. So this would be, this might be like your aggregate. If this is like on the y-axis is absorbance. Absorbance at some protein that reads tryptophans or something like that. Um, absorbance, so you're basically measuring how much protein is there. This will be your aggregate. This is a bunch of crap. This might be your protein X. And then this would be a little, maybe a degradative product, degradative product of X. And then this might be contaminant. So then you'd want to pool these fractions, which might correspond to fractions three to eight. You pull those and that's what you got. Does that make sense? So that's FPLC. Um, okay, I'll stop there. So I did assign a reading recombinant, making recombinant spider silk. It's a real cool protein and we're going to talk about it next session on Wednesday. So read this paper that I assigned for Wednesday. Okay, and then we'll go back to lab. It'll be a low-key lab. I'll just kind of show you all this stuff. I'll walk you through like a mock um, recombinant protein expression.